the dynamics of today. So um, we have three minutes for each of you to present. Each presenter is allowed to use just one slide and their beautiful voices to explain <laughs> something that has to do with your research or some research that you're really, uh, involved with. So I've always wanted to be a teacher, and in 2002, I started a Bachelor of Education degree to fulfill my goal. During my B.Ed., I came to the realization that my vision of what teaching was and should be was not in alignment with the dominant vision of the program that I was in. This disconnect between my vision of teaching and what I was learning highlighted challenges at the institutional level, level curricular level, what I was actually learning, and pedagogical level, how I actually learned things in the program. My experience highlights that pre-service teacher ed programs are not preparing all students to become the kinds of teachers that they want to be. If the systems and practices in pre-service teacher ed don't make space for the varied needs and understandings of pre-service teachers, then it is in essence limiting the possibility for change in the world. In society, higher education institutions, particularly pre-service teacher ed programs, and teachers are responsible for holding the children of the world. Drawing on Hannah Arendt's concept of natality, which is the distinctly human capacity to bring forth the new, the radical, the unprecedented, that which is unaccountable by any natural causality, my research explores pre-service teachers' responsibility to support the coming of children into the world. The coming of children is connected to birth, beginning, freedom, starting something new, and action, doing the unexpected. According to Arendt, action as the realization of freedom is rooted in natality, or the fact that each birth represents a new beginning and the introduction of novelty in the world. If pre-service teacher ed and teaching become tools to perpetuate dominant ideas about how to be in the world, then children will stop coming, starting new things, taking action, and doing unexpected things in the world. What kind of world will society be left with? The world will die. Recognizing that pre-service and in-service teachers are always considering the children in their midst as they engage in all of the activities inherent in teaching, the question is, how can all pre-service teachers be prepared to handle the children in their midst? If this is the problem, the opportunity uh, is to understand how pre-service teachers conceive of their role as educators in helping these children come into the world. My research explores this question. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jiao, third year PhD in EDCP. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the Chinese Science Museum educators' needs and the concerns for professional development. Um, this is also my research question. So this is uh, interpretive research, which is informed by the social cultural theory and the community of practice theoretical framework. Um, I interviewed 23 Chinese Science Museum educators in five science museums in the mainland of China. Uh, after the data analysis, three things emerged. So the first theme is about the, their expected fields for professional development. And Chinese Science Museum educators expected to enhance their personal com job competency in several fields, like the content knowledge, the pedagogical knowledge, the evaluation skills, and the communication skills. Um, besides, they also hope to become an educator of other museum educators. The second theme is their preferred pathways for professional development, which includes external communication, formal training, self-regulated learning, learning along with teaching practices and the cross-departmental training. The third theme is that Chinese Science Museum educators found the social cultural factors had have huge impacts on their professional development. Therefore, they hope to they hope museums can refine their, their work. They hope mm, the museums can increase the degrees of the autonomous on museum education work. As well, they also hope museums can provide them with a clear and a professional scen pro development scenarios for them. In conclusion, from their interpretation, it can be seen that they are desired for a kind of professional community. In this community, they can communicate with peer colleagues. They can share experiences with, with novice educators. And they also 
can learn from experienced museum educators. In other words, they hope to materialize, they hope to in interact, communicate, and change ideas with other professionals. Besides, they also hope to cross the departmental boundary department border to broaden their views. Meanwhile, but as well, they also hope to build a kind of boundaries to protect their self, their own expertise, and enhance their social status, and establish a kind of uh, be, uh, sense of belonging to museum education work. That's all. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, today, schools seem to be more and more drawn to the factory mode, whose success is to be believed to be secured by technology or technical approaches, which is as Pioneer in 2012 decried in the conference presentation that technology had become not, not just one optional mode, but the only one way of life in the Earth. We could detect the underlying assumptions of monitoring, controlling, securing, eliminating risks for heavy reliance on technology or teaching techniques for teacher education or teaching. Phonesis and techne are two ancient concepts, belong to Aristotle's five intellectual virtues. Phonesis could be translated into Chinese as wisdom, prudence, practical wisdom, or practical judgment while techne is for craft, art, skill, technical expertise, or technology in modern terms. While phonesis enjoys a, an experiential nature and usually understood as a capacity to do the right thing the right, right way in the right context, uh, context for the right reasons at the right time and considered as a marshalling virtue among other intellectual virtues, a common interpretation of techne has been detached, separate, uh, or transcendent from the experiential grounds. Scholarly works like McIntyre, Nussbaum, Hughes, Fallon are mounting to revive Aristotelian phonesis as a situated intellectual virtue embedded in experiences as a replacement to the technical approaches. Insufficient discussions are paid to the in-between spaces of techne and phonesis in the literature. Hence, I sense a strong need to investigate the phenomenon and to reinterpret techne and phonesis through the lenses of Ted Aoki's framework of in-betweenness. I hope to recover the hermeneutic dialogue between the two important concepts as dwelling in the third space and, and explore their encountering with teaching or teacher education to offer more imaginations. We will refer to the notions of phonesis and techne rather than the separate notions of phonesis versus techne, it could be connected to teacher education to problematize the technical approach dominant training programs and recover its experiential grounds. That's it. Thank you. Every year, an increasing number of uh, domestic and international graduate students enter Canadian universities carrying lots of hopes and concerns in their backpacks. As the academic year begins, one of the earliest questions coming to students' minds evolves around how to pass courses successfully and get good marks, a significant part of which is usually allocated to final papers. As an integral part of final papers in graduate level, students are expected to support their arguments using available literature in the field. Here is where the student writers have to unweave another string of questions. What reliable sources should I use for writing about my topic of interest? How should I pull out information from those sources? Do I really need to cite these ideas, or they are too common to be cited? Having heard these and many similar questions from graduate students, as an academic writing teacher and second language writing researcher, I'm conducting my doctoral project investigating the textual borrowing and citation practices of uh, doctoral and uh, master's students in writing their term papers and uh, they are actually both coming from domestic and international backgrounds and I'm also investigating their course instructors views on their practices. 
I'm planning to shed light on the blurry area of inappropriate versus uh, appropriate textual borrowing to eventually offer pedagogical rather than punitive implications and suggestions for researchers, teachers, and student writers. To this end, I'm drawing on a theories of uh, forms of capital and dialogism, both embedded in the larger lens of communities of practice. Currently, I'm unpacking and analyzing students' strategies and challenges in the process of integrating sources into their academic texts as they are socializing into academic context. Thank you. My research focuses on mathematics education in general and mathematics worksheets in specific because um, all around the world, mathematics education involves the use of curriculum materials and a number of studies indicated that um, these curriculum materials influence how teachers teach and interact with their students as well as their and students' interaction with mathematics. Um, if we think about um, curriculum materials in mathematics classrooms, I guess textbooks are the most conventional ones. But in addition to textbooks, and um, sometimes in place of it, worksheets are used too. In my classrooms, worksheets were the most common and dominant teaching tools. And meeting different um, mathematics teachers from various backgrounds, I realized this is not unique to me, but it's very widespread all around the world, the use of worksheets. Um, so um, this realization, in a way, made me critically think about worksheets and the notion of worksheets in mathematics classrooms and the reasons and motivations for us to use worksheets. Literature suggests that worksheets are repetitive skill drill tools, emphasize um, uh, traditional patterns of teaching and emphasize accuracy, individual learning, and instrumental understanding. Um, in my research, I questioned this and um, I conceptualized worksheet as a genre, a form of cultural knowledge, and um, I attempt to understand what worksheets really are. Uh, by the aid of um, genre analysis, originally from literary and film studies, I try to understand why are we using worksheets, how are we using worksheets, do we need to consider them differently, if yes, why and how, and I guess by doing so, in a way, um, I'm also um, exploring the value of interdisciplinary approach in educational research. Thank you. Okay, uh, instead of uh, telling you some complicated theory or something like that, I would like to tell you a very simple story. When I was admitted into Zhejiang University in China, I thought I was alive again without the huge burden of a college entrance examination. <laughs> like many of my peers, I now had a plenty of spare time and spent more and uh, began to use social network sites such as Ren Ren Net, which is equivalent, a Chinese equivalent of Facebook, and also Weibo, which is similar to Twitter. I found these sites to be amazing places to know what was happening with my friends and uh, to establish new relationships, also to express my personal ideas. This new way of communication made me addicted to it and I couldn't help checking it every day. <laughs> However, my excitement of social media disappeared gradually while a feeling of confusion came up. I found that some friends I knew, or thought I knew, seemed to be strangers online because they talk with others online in another tone or exp ex express their ideas or values, which I have never heard about when <laughs> offline. So I realized there is a gap between the online and offline persona. In real life, some of them will hide their opinions, perhaps to avoid personal conflicts. However, on the social network sites, they have more freedom to speak about themselves. That's why I experienced more value conflicts on social media. As a result, I started to doubt the value I adhere to are wrong or out of date, or whether I'm a weirdo in others' eyes. <laughs> this feeling led to what I call my self-identity panic. I felt isolated and marginalized. 
So I wonder, do other undergraduates in China have the same experience as me? How do they deal with the different roles played online and offline? And how they perceive the social media in terms of self-identity? Then that is where I started my thesis. In my research, I will focus on undergraduates in China because they are the largest group of people who use social media every day. And I will use quantitative interview to hear their voices and to explore how they understand social media in terms of self-identity, value conflicts, as well as peer relationships. I believe my research will help to unpack the issue of uh, undergraduates' use of social media and finally help them grow healthily. That's all. Thanks. <laughs> In English, there's the expression to take someone down the garden path, which links gardens with deception and uncertainty. So today, in these short three minutes, I'd like to invite you down some garden paths that are complex and contested, where familiar notions of gardens and teaching might be unsettled in generative ways. First of all, let us consider the cliché that I hear often in my field of environmental education or garden-based education, which is that the garden or land or nature can be a teacher. What does this mean? I began to do this doctoral research with this question, which led to some preliminary historical research into school gardens, and you can see these images on the top left-hand corner. Drawing on my own positionality as a German-Canadian, I focused specifically on school gardens in Germany and North America, though my research did go as far back as Epicurus's garden school in ancient Athens, and there are many more examples to be found around the world. These garden paths were, and still are, difficult and dark. War, eugenics, assimilation, and the logic of the grid all challenged me to question gardens as natural, or places where children connect with nature. I won't go any further down this path now. Suffice it to say that the first phase of my arts-based doctoral research struggled to address and respond to these difficult histories. And you can see the, the gridded flax beds at the orchard garden where I work with student teachers is where I'm struggling with that. So the second theme that I explore in my research is more theoretical, informed by material feminists such as Donna Haraway, Karen Barad, and Elizabeth Gross. While the first theme delves into discursive issues, colonialism, nationalism, gender, racism, and so on, this second seeks to engage differently with the materiality of teaching in gardens. Just as the all too familiar gridded classroom design follows us outside, this is Froebel's design of a kindergarten, does that familiar teacher, the self-contained, rational, in-control person who transmit knowledge, also follow us outside? Here I'm not so sure. But I can attest that this research has created profound relationships with a multitude of human and non-human creatures and things that decenter who or what teaches. Arts-based research has been a powerful methodological approach to foster and attend to these relationships that more conventional research may perhaps have missed. And so you can see many of these relationships that have emerged throughout the research. Finally, when a garden becomes a teacher, can this sow seeds, perhaps unruly weed seeds like the fireweed on the bottom right hand corner, that can unsettle human nature relationships? This is the provocative gift with which I leave you. Uh, I examined the parent-child interactions while they read the different types of books, print and the di three different types of digital books. And um, actually, I did a master thesis uh, on this topic as well. And I found you know, the focus of their talk and types of their talk were different. But then in my PhD uh, dissertation, I expanded the, the notion. Uh, so I used uh, systemic functional linguistics. So this is a social linguistics perspective as well as the um, uh, cognitive perspective from uh, based on Vygotsky's theory. So uh, here the showing the context and the, the inter, uh, social interaction is connected and also this interaction is going into the you know uh, encourage uh, children's development inside their uh, you know uh, uh, pro processing their information inside their um, thinking. Uh, and I found uh, some interesting uh, findings. Uh, first, uh, uh, you know, uh, their focus of talk was different. For example, uh, in the print book, uh, they talk more about the illustrations as well as the uh, about the stories. But in the digital book, they just talk about um, the um, story content rather than the illustration because you know the. 
uh, digital book just passed very fast, so they didn't have much time to process the information and uh, discuss the information. And also, um, uh, SFL allowed me to examine how they build their meaning uh, while they reading the print and the digital books. I found uh, the, in the computer books, um, uh, parents didn't really uh, develop their discussion because the narration of the digital book cut their you know flow of their talk. Uh, but um, in print book and the handheld uh, digital uh, electronic book, which is uh, just like print book, and they use the digital pen and they can you know uh, click on each word and uh, uh, picture. And that those two books uh, actually. Um, uh, in those two book contexts, parent and child uh, interacted much more and also they talk more follow-up questions and comments. So in those two contexts, I could see you know, uh, the meaning of, um, the construction of their meaning uh, was uh, much deeper and go further than the uh, computer books. What I, um, I, what I want to say uh, at the end is we need to consider you know, how to design those digital books, you know, enhance parent-child interactions and also possibly peer interactions because uh, many people assume you know, digital books is just for self-reading or you know, kids read by themselves, but it doesn't have to be uh, from my perspective because now we have lots of digital devices like uh, you know, uh, iPad and you know, many digital devices. Well, those should not go like you know babysitter, but you know how we can use them more productive ways and at school and home. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I want to talk about what I discovered in my research, which I conducted last year in Uganda. Um, when I came to do this master's, I was so pumped up to do research in sex health education. Having been a teacher in Uganda, taught biology and everything, so time for me to choose a topic, I thought sex health was the best for me. And I went pumped up with all these things I thought I would bring to the curriculum in Uganda. So I went down there, I interviewed teachers. So I just want us to talk about one of the themes which came up during my research, and that is navigating imagined dichotomies in adolescent sex health education. Um, down there I discovered it was very complex. As I speak and as I stand here, I think I'm more confused than mm -hmm. I was before I went to do this research. And um, maybe this cartoon right there would just show you how the teacher in that classroom feels when they're trying to navigate this discourse. They are there in the middle, they have their social stances, they have different stakeholders coming in and remember in Uganda there is no set curriculum like here and yet they're supposed to meet the needs of these uh, students and uh, the negative sex health outcomes are evident. So how is a teacher, um, well this was hit me hard because I've taught biology, biology and science. Usually we talk about facts. If I say the sun comes from this, that's it. If I say the uh, leaf is green, that's it. But now this came, it hit me so hard. How are teachers in such discourses supposed to navigate them? Two uh, of the most imagined dichotomies which emerged was condom use uh, versus abstinence, Western influence versus African culture. People were looking at this Western an invasion of the cherished African culture. And if both sides were to stand and defend what they were talking about, they all made sense. So what are we supposed to do as teachers or as educators? So I was just asking myself uh, this question of Erickson, like, how do we navigate such a discourse which has so many faces like a crystal? Even as I write, I see writing every day, I'm trying to have it to my professor. I don't know what to write. I don't know the implications. I am as confused, but I hope at the end of the day, it is going to help me think more about such a discourse. So thank you very much. I'm going to start with a question, but unfortunately I don't have time for answers from you <laughs> for now. So um, what are the ways in which we can promote um, children's emotional understanding, empathy, and well-being, knowing that these protective factors uh, have been identified to foster children's positive development 
and school success. Imagine that we can provide teachers with the um, skills to implement a program that utilizes video stories as a, way, as a way in which to instigate discussions about relationships, about empathy, about um, self-regulation, about relationships in general, using literature, using books, using puppetry. As Adriana said, my name is Angela Jaramillo. That's the Spanish version of my name. <laughs> I'm originally from Colombia, and I'm a PhD student in the ECPS department. For the past several years, I've been working in Dr. Kim Schoner Reichel's uh, lab, conducting research in the, in the area of social and emotional learning and development. I'm currently the project coordinator, one of them, of the uh, Taxi Dog um, Educational Curriculum Research Study. Taxi Dog is a newly and innovative social and emotional learning program. It focuses on promoting social and emotional competence and self-regulation in children from kindergarten to grade three. And they use, um, as I said, videos, literature, and puppetry. All of the children in, from kindergarten to grade three get the, um, the puppets for them to use, one for each um, student. So the purpose of the study is to explore the feasibility and preliminary outcomes of the taxi dog research study. We did the uh, implementation evaluation first. We're doing the uh, uh, second phase now. The study is a multi-site study. We're conducting, um, collecting data from three, across three sites uh, here in Vancouver. Valley Stream in New York and Saratoga, California. We have 36 uh, teachers participating and about 700 um, students are providing us with a lot of light. Um, it is a multi-method, multi-informant um, study. We have measures, direct child measures, and we are uh, collecting data on empathy, perspective taking, emotion identification, emotion understanding, pro-social behaviors. We're interested in self-regulation and we're uh, collecting da data using um, executive functions uh, and school connectedness as well. We have teacher reports of child and we have implementation measures as well. And um, this is a experimental design. We're using the uh, pre-test, post-test control groups, and uh, we are randomly assigning uh, teachers to uh, whether they will be in, in taxi dog or classrooms. And although we are still collecting data, um, and hoping to be finished by the end of the summer, uh, the results of the study will uh, will hoping will shed light on the psychological and contextual effects of taxi dog on children's social and emotional development, self regulation, and uh, school adjustment, and also to identify some mechanisms through which we can promote. Uh, social and emotional competence and mental health in children. So if you're interested, just go to the website uh, or get in contact with either uh, Dr. Shana Reichel or myself. Hi, everyone. I will start with a question. How can we reconnect children and nature to encouraging them a responsible and ethical attitude toward environment? In 1929, Alma, a 12 years old girl, wrote to her teacher the following. I tried hard to walk through the woods without making a sound. I was doing so once and heard an odd noise ahead of me. I looked up and I saw a moose about 20 paces from me in the middle of the road. I stopped and stood still in the road. I was too surprised to do anything that moose just walked down the road quietly and turned off into the woods. I am glad that I've learned to be not afraid of anything in the woods because it is just as afraid of me. This letter shows us how close children were related to nature in the past of rural British Columbia. Alma's letter is one of the more than thousand letters written by parents and children in 1920s and 1940s as the only way to communicate with their teachers. In 1919, the Department of Education of British Columbia established the Elementary Correspondence School to provide formal education for children either too far from a school or with limited access due to difficult physical terrain. Through the Land is My School project, a project funded by a Hampton Research Grant, 
Dr. Mona Gleason and I pursued the question of what can we learn from children's experiences in the past that might usefully inform contemporary environmental research in British Columbia and education. Drawing on children's geographies and the history of children in BC, we analyzed the data in, in the light of a radical pedagogy of place proposed by Dr. Claudia Rutenberg. Our preliminary findings indicate that the letters written by children, their parents, and their teachers served as a vehicle by which the school located in town traveled to children's places and influenced their identities in a continuous negotiation between opposed notion of a space and time. A school lessons competed for a place in children's routines of planting, harvesting, and hunting. As a result of getting formal education, children and their families were slowly modifying their routines, transforming children's role of peasants in their role as students. Children's natural places represented a side of learning that was as powerful than their school lessons. However, children's relationship with the elementary correspondence schools also played an important role in shaping their identities and future attitudes toward environment. From these two relationships, we hope to learn and propose implication for environmental education in British Columbia. Uh, I'm exploring how museum educators feel about developing and or facilitating educational programming for children. With, uh, and with cognitive disabilities. When I talk about children, I'm looking specifically at kids between 6 and 13, so in the context of British Columbia, your general elementary school students. Um, I'm using, for cognitive disabilities, I'm purposely keeping it a very wide term. There's a, many different cognitive disabilities. All children who are experiencing a life with one of these experience them completely differently. Just consider the autism spectrum disorder scale. So many, so I'm keeping it purposely wide because of all the different kinds of kids these museum educators will work with as they go. And additionally, one thing that has come up lots of times in our program, so I want, I feel I should expound on this. When I say museums, I don't just mean the Belkin. I don't just mean the VAG. To us, museums are any informal learning institutions where educational experiences for visitors of all ages are developed and implemented. So. Art galleries, parks, aquariums, science centers, uh, interpretive sites, that kind of thing. So one of the main roles of a museum educator, of the museum, pardon me, in the community is that of educator. And the role of the museum educator is to facilitate educational experiences for all visitors who visit that institution, regardless of age, ability, language, anything really. So one of the many different kinds of visitors that we work with are, as museum educators are little kids. They come often in school groups or they come with their parents, with their friends. They want to hang out. Just Museums are really cool to little kids. We've come to realize this. I've learned this on my internship too. Uh, a lot, and then mixed into those kids a lot of the time are children with cognitive disabilities. So what I found as I've been doing it is there's a lot of research that develops on the, implement, the development, implementation, and evaluation of pre-existing programming, such as the uh, special opening hours for children with a, on, the, on the autism spectrum. You can go in, it's quiet hours, it's somebody else's topic, I won't get into it. But there's not very much on how the museum educators themselves feel about doing this. How do they, do they feel comfortable? Do they know what, do they, as one of my interviewees put it, I don't necessarily know what I'm doing half the time when these kids come in. I want, I want to learn more about it. I've, I'm approaching how the educators feel about it because to me it's important to consider this because they're the ones working with the kids. And if they're not, they don't feel comfortable or ready or that they're the person to be working with these children, how, what kind of effective educational experience can they deliver to these kids? So, as I said, I'm in the process of conducting interviews with uh, practicing museum educators in the Lower Mainland, gathering data about how they feel, and we'll eventually take the results from that, somehow put it into a, a graduating paper, <laughs> and then hopefully that can maybe be extrapolated upon in the future to give museum educators more of a voice in how they pr approach working with kids of all ability levels and Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, 
my research aims to investigate how a general education program, the UNP program, was initiated and implemented in Peking University in China. I, the, the UNP program is an institution-wide curriculum innovation modeling on the core curriculum of Harvard University, which is committed to carrying out general education. The purpose of the program is to explore uh, a model of Thailand cultivation, and it is to uh, cultivate talents, meeting the demand of society with broad knowledge base, a spirit of innovation, as as well as strong adaptability. Um, the rationale for this program lies in that every undergraduate should be educated broadly. Um, such an exploration requires a framework informed by the literature of curriculum innovation and the curriculum implementation. There are three approaches proposed by uh, Senator uh, Bolin and Zoomwalk uh, to better understanding the uh, curriculum implementation. The first approach is the fidelity approach. This approach assumes that a curriculum is successful only when teacher carries out curriculum innovation as directed. Uh, the curriculum is, is uh, evaluated to determine whether the intended goal has been achieved. Uh, the second uh, approach is mutual adaptation. This approach refers to a process in which adjustments in curriculum are made by both curriculum developers and the teachers who actually use the curriculum in classroom context. The third approach is enactment approach. According to this uh, perspective, teachers' uh, curriculum are uh, jointly uh, created by teachers and students. Teachers and students combine to construct or enact the curriculum. Uh, my study, uh, this study will adopt a qualitative case study approach. Uh, much emphasis will be placed on ex uh, describing, interpreting, and exploring the, the events in the real world, real world setting of the university. Data collection method will involve uh, interview, uh, class observation, and documentation. My research will uh, will extend, will verify and extend the theory of curriculum innovation and the curriculum implementation. In addition to that, uh, education reforms have not been reported extensively to the English world, I mean, in about Chinese context. So, okay, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. research today. Funnily enough, a few days ago, just to find this image, I was typing into Google search school bullying and looking for images. And what came out was still, well, most of what came out were, were the images that essentially depicted the narrative of the big, powerful thug picking on and hitting the little, little kid in the playground. And then I thought, well, this is why my research matters. This is why this matters. Because the narrative has changed. And that image of the physically hurt victim with the cut lip and the black eye, that sort of still reigns despite lots of research that shows that actually now the, the wounds are internal and they cut a lot deeper. So much of the repeated hurtful aggression we associate with bullying in schools has now gone underground. It's not just a very physical torment in the playground, but really it's the daily torment of the hurtful words and in hallways and classrooms and social exclusion that can leave a victim in isolation for like days if not weeks. And then there's the cyberbullying, which is a whole different bucket of hurt, right? So. Numerous studies have now shown that teachers and staff in schools are mostly not aware of the bulk of the bullying that happens in their classrooms. Um, and studies have also shown that the bullies are, are the popular kids. They're the cool boys and girls that many kids look up to. So the herd is no longer doled up by the kid with the bold fist, but the popular kid with the power of words and what I think is certain social and emotional skills that allow them to really sort of navigate the social world um, that facilitates them getting people on their side and that helps them stay way under the radar of the teachers and the staff. So that's the beliefs that we're looking at. So my research examines the relationships between these key emotional skills 
um, and the students report of engaging in bullying behavior or whether they report being victimized. So four to seventh graders are, are asked first to select emotional words that describe their overall affective state, like do they generally feel happy or stressed or anxious or joyful. Um, and then they have to complete some measures of emotional skills, like we look at emotion understanding and expression, um, emotional regulation, and also an empathy measure. And in the empathy, there's cognitive empathy and also affective empathy. And then, we, and then they report if they're bullying. They're bullied physically, um, socially, verbally, and cyberbullying. And I predict that in particular, the social bullies and the cyber bullies are going to perform, actually perform well on the emotional skills assessments, except for, I think, um, affective empathy. So the ability to feel how the other person feels. This study will take place as the fourth wave of an ongoing school climate in Vancouver. It's conducted by the Social Emotional Education Development Lab, the SEED lab that I'm part of by Shelley Emil at UBC, which goes out to 19 schools in five districts, so it's big, and examines this ongoing study that already exists, examines the relationships between school climate and bullying, so that's already in place. Um, to piggyback my research onto this study has the benefits of getting lots of participants without me doing a lot of the work, which is really cool. But then the problem is it's already a 72 item questionnaire, which means that you know I'm sort of making it a hundred question, like a hundred questions, so the poor kids have to do this. So I hope that the research is going to add to the body of literature um, to help create more effective prevention programs. Um, essentially, um, I think we need to change the outdated perceptions of school bullying to encourage adults to look a bit deeper um, at what's going on between the kids and uncovering the hurt and isolation that might be happening right under their noses. And hopefully my Google search will change a bit next year and look different. <laughs>